Next up, we have Sasa Milic, our independent researcher who will be discussing Oracle trade-offs. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Sorry, I changed my subject from what it said in the brochure. I think I did the same thing last year, so apologies. Uh, yeah, so uh, what I'm going to discuss is just some recent Oracle hacks, and recent is like last like year or two, and if there's any kind of conclusions or high-level thoughts that can be extracted from that. Oh, and... <laughs> How does this work? Okay, okay, I got it. Uh, yeah, so I took this from chain analysis. So it looks like in the last two years, there was about, or uh, according to them, there was about like a billion dollars lost to Oracle hacks. But this slide is a little bit, um, a little bit deceiving, because I'm, I'm bringing this up because it seems like what the greater crypto blockchain community considers an Oracle hack is quite different from what people that work in Oracles and build Oracle protocols actually consider an Oracle hack. So I feel like most people um, here probably already know this, but, but I'll say it anyways. But most of what's considered an Oracle hack and most of the money lost is actually uh, manipulating the underlying price. So taking some low liquidity uh, shitcoin and making like a large trade on a DEX and uh, significantly affecting the price. And then using that to, I don't know, like liquidate or buy cheap tokens. But basically, when you can, manip when you can manipulate a price, you can steal a lot of money. So yeah, so I'm bringing this up because this, a lot of people that work in oracles would, wouldn't consider, they'd consider that not an oracle hack, like that's a different issue, but. Yeah, so from the same article, they say uh, increasing the trading volume of low liquidity tokens, and that's what they consider uh, an oracle hack. So I bring that up because um, I, I want to cover things that people that actually build oracles would consider uh, oracle hacks or oracle attacks. So I'll start with what I consider uh, statistical errors. Yeah, okay, so about, about uh, one and a half years ago, Pyth reported a really, really low price for uh, BTC in the span of about two minutes, but I was able to find on Twitter a lot of angry users from uh, Mango Markets who uh, were unfairly liquidated. So even though this, this price, these uh, price errors only occurred within two minutes, uh, yeah, it, it did affect uh, quite a lot of users. So um, I won't get into exactly how Pyth works, but I will mention that their oracles return a price, and they also return a confidence interval. So those are the orange things you see on the right. Those are the confidence intervals returned by Pyth. And I also want to say that th this was BTC, so this is one, the one that affected most users, but uh, they also, around the same time period, were reporting incorrect prices for Doge, AMC, GMC, and a bunch of other, um, a bunch of other assets. Sorry. Okay, so um, this isn't, this is kind of like a toy example, but I feel like it illustrates what the issue was way quicker than if I like explained it um, with a bunch of bullet points and equations. But basically like their, um, their node software uh, had some sort of bug when it came to converting floats to integers. So again, I feel like most people would know this, but everything on Ethereum is, everything on blockchains is typically integers. So there was some like client issue uh, that made a bunch of floats convert into uh, integers close to zero. And they had some sort of like outlier detection mechanism, but the outlier detection mechanism was based off of uh, nearest neighbors. So like two points were close to zero, so their, their outlier detection completely failed to catch these as outliers. And they also, their confidence intervals, for some reason at this time, the way they were computing them was raw values. So like dollar values and not percentages. So um, the confidence intervals near zero should be large relative to the actual price, but because it was just raw, um, raw dollars, the the confidence intervals were were considered small. Um, 
so that's, again, this isn't the actual data, but I feel like the, the picture represents what the issue was. So when they ended up aggregating all of this, the price was like pushed down to like 5,000 when it should have been like 40,000. Um, and I will note that since, yeah, so, so let me just go back. So this, in, the, in that two minute period, they got data points that ended up bypassing their outlier detection and bypassing their, uh, their confidence interval mechanism, which is supposed to measure how, how accurate someone's price is. Um, yeah, so I will mention that they, they, they did make a fix to this. So they said that they uh, adjusted their aggregation logic after this uh, occurred, although I wasn't able actually to find what the current algorithm is. So this isn't a very good slide, but I'll try to explain my point. The Pyth network, I'm not, I'm not trying to pick on them, but like they, from my research, their protocol uses the most amount of statistics of any protocol. Like They use a lot of statistics baked into their protocol. So their aggregation, um, so, so these are different parameters that their aggregation function takes into consideration. So they have some sort of like outlier removal. They try to wait, they try to wait according to accuracy. So this is based off of self-reported confidence interv intervals. Uh, they aggregate the confidence intervals in some way. And then uh, in addition to that, individual points are weighted by stake. And then they also have a pretty complicated mechanism for how you do reward distribution. So a lot of like, um, advanced, not advanced, but like relatively complicated statistical modeling to determine which, which oracles get rewarded and how much. And it, it might not be immediately clear why I'm bringing this up, but it'll be more clear later. Um, yeah, so other than Pyth, this is just like a smattering of examples to say that this isn't the only example of like people attempting to do outlier detection with Oracle with, um, while, when aggregating oracles, like other people have attempted this. Inter interestingly, um, I'm sure people here know Samson. I don't know if that's how you say his name, but he's like one of the most well-known security researchers in this space. But he wrote a, a pretty good article, Taking Under, Collateral under Collateralized Loans for Fun and for Profit. Um, so this, he wrote this in like 2019, I think after one of the first or the first um, oracle price manipulation attacks. And he actually suggested to create, and the, the, the um, the Oracle hack was on DAI, a stable coin. So someone manipulated DAI using one of these um, uh, flash loan attacks. And he suggested, you know, create sanity bounds between 0.95 and 1.05. So that was his suggestion. And I bring that up because it's kind of funny because other people have uh, implemented that and it actually didn't work. Like uh, Chainlink had some sort of, I, I can't remember the details now, but they had some sort of, uh, sanity bound check for Luna for some reason. And when Luna crashed, the chain link price oracles were actually stuck at 0 0.1. So that's not exactly outlier detection, but I feel like it um, is within the same category. And then I also bring up the original chain link white paper that suggested the way that they were going to do slashing um, for, for stake nodes was they kind of mentioned offhand uh, deviations from responses um, misbehavior, so they kind of offhand mention things that sound like outlier detection, but they haven't implemented any of this, which I assume is because it, they realize it just like doesn't work. Yeah, so I guess uh, what, what I'm trying to say is, yeah, I guess in my opinion, the more stats you have baked into the protocol, and, and I wanted to clarify because some people don't know, like statistics is a subfield of math, but a stat statistic is a is the re result of applying an algorithm to a set of data, so things like mean and variance. So the more statistics baked into a protocol, is, it's just a bad idea because you pretty much have like an infinite attack surface because... Yeah, so basically like how do you prove that something works for every possible distribution or even every possible reasonable distribution? It's pretty much like an infinite attack area. And then this is, this is probably a more important point, that random noise isn't the same as having adversarial data points. So the way that a lot of, again, I don't want to pick on Pyth, but they're just the one that use the most statistics in their solution. 
but they kind of use this traditional statistical approach where you're dealing with random data that's just drawn from a random distribution, and that's not the same thing as people being adversarial and, and producing adversarial data. So, and the only, the only um, academic discipline that I know that actually makes this distinction is something called adversarial machine learning, which is... Uh, looking at how people can fool AI to produce like erroneous data, and maybe you guys have seen this with like people trying to fool ChatGPT. So that's within the area of adversarial machine learning that makes a distinction between random data and and adversarial data. And I don't, I haven't seen anyone making these oracle protocols doing statistics actually make this distinction. I think it's an important distinction to make in the crypto space. Oh, and I, I do want to say that I, I think a lot of Oracle projects have recognized this, either explicitly or implicitly. And, and this being that if you're going to detect incorrect and malicious responses, you can only do it after the fact, just because, like I said, you can't test things on every possible distribution. And I, I don't want to get into the math details. But so a, a lot of projects, and I feel like pretty much most crypto projects are converging to the point of doing something after the fact, so either insurance or a dispute period or both. So it's like it's accepting the fact that bad data, malicious data will come through and there needs to be something after the fact that, um, that deals with it. So uh, off the top of my head, I know people that their original solutions included something like Dispute or Insurance or API 3, Teller, UMA. There's a lot more, but those are off the top of my head. And interestingly enough, um, when you read Chainlink 2.0 and even the, the Pyth white paper that came after the hack, they start talking about these dispute resolution periods. And like I said, I think it's because people have realized that you just can't detect in this blockchain environment, you can't detect errors as soon as they happen. You can only do it after the fact. Uh, and then, I'm kind of running out of time. I'll just briefly go through what I consider like integration errors. So these are things that I would, I'd argue with is not the fault of the Oracle protocol, is actually the fault of people integrating it incorrectly. Um, so I'm actually friends with a lot of people from Teller, so don't get mad until I finish explaining, <laughs> explaining the point. But yeah, something called BonkDAO actually lost a ton of... I mean, that's a pretty large Oracle, um, pretty large DeFi hack even for crypto, but 120 million. And what they did is they literally just um, sent... They, 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 someone just sent Teller an incorrect price. And the way that Teller works, like their entire security mechanism is a dispute period. Like anyone can submit a response. If they, if they stake the, the minimal amount of crypto, and then they have a dispute period. So their, their, entire, their entire security apparatus is dispute period. So the fact that BonkDAO integrated them and just took the, the first price and completely ignored the dispute period, it's kind of like their fault, because they pretty much like nullified the entire security apparatus. I don't know if I explained that well, but um, another thing is the, 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 the thing I mentioned earlier with Pyth, they actually argued like, well, the users, by the way, the users didn't actually look at the confidence intervals, and that's why they're there for. So um, the, the people that integrated Pyth with the attack that I, that I explained earlier, uh, if they were actually paying attention to the confidence intervals, they shouldn't have even used that price. So this is another arguably integration error that's partly on the fault of the DeFi protocol. Um, oh, this, is, this is another one, Geist Finance. They were, they were using Chainlink, but they were operating on Phantom. And when there was a hack on the multi-chain bridge, all of these assets, USDC, whatever, like all these wrapped assets on Phantom ended up going to zero. But they were using Chainlink prices that were reporting market-wide prices. So, I mean, they tried blaming Chainlink, but arguably, again, this is an integration issue. They weren't using the Oracle as, uh, as they should have. Uh, I'll skip this one just to get to my last slide. So, like, what is the point of my presentation? <laughs> again, I, I looked at hacks, like I said, I looked at hacks in the last year or two and just tried to take away some, some points from it. So I think, I think the Oracle is still extremely not well-defined. 
unfortunately, even after all these years. For example, it's really not clear if the oracle is the ground truth or is it just relaying information. And if it's relaying information, whose job is it to decide the data source? Like, all these things aren't really decided yet. And um, it's kind of cliche to say that language is important, but I feel like we might potentially be limiting ourselves or limiting scientific and technological pro uh, progress, and we haven't really even defined the problem correctly. Like, very few people can agree on what an oracle is and what, what its scope of operations are. Um, like I mentioned before, designing a system relying on complicated statistics is probably a bad idea within um, the context of blockchains and oracles. And users should understand what they're integrating to their system. So this isn't Web 2, where you just paste a bunch of APIs together every time you integrate something into your protocol as a crypto project. You should be very, very aware of what you're integrating. Like, it's not a black box. Um, I'm a little bit over, so yeah.